Iwubdar and her sister Senadu, who would later serve as vice president of Ethiopia's parliament, were sent to Switzerland for boarding school. It was in Switzerland that Yewubdar's love of music began. She returned to Ethiopia in 1934 and was quickly recognized as a musical prodigy, and at one point, still in her pre-teens, sang for Emperor Selassie at a party. In 1936, Italy invaded Ethiopia, and following the executions of three of her brothers and her father and sister joining of the resistance movement, Yewubdar and her family were taken as political prisoners. Following the end of Mussolini's occupation, the family returned to Ethiopia, and Yewubdar became the first woman to work for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. With no institutions in Ethiopia to further her training in Western classical music, Yewubdar eventually moved to Cairo to study violin and piano. After two years of intense studying, practicing piano for five hours a day and violin for four hours a day, she returned to Ethiopia for the more temperate climate. Once home, she was accepted to the Royal Academy of Music in London, but was curiously not given permission to attend by the Ethiopian authorities. She slipped into a depression, refused to eat for 12 days, and after being hospitalized, began to attend services at the Ethiopian Orthodox Church with newfound enthusiasm. Of the disappointment, she said, it was his willing. We can choose how to respond. This devotion eventually led her to join the Gishen Mariam Monastery, a remote hilltop sanctuary with no electricity and beds made of mud. There she lived barefoot and became a nun at the age of 24. In Ethiopia, Emohoi is an honorific, honorific given to a nun, and Sege Mariam was a new name she chose. Sege meaning flower, and Mariam for the Virgin Mary. For approximately 10 years, Emohoi forgo her musical career, once remarking, no shoes, no music, just prayer. It resumed when she returned to Addis Ababa to live with her mother, and in addition to teaching at an orphanage, worked as a musician alongside Emperor Selassie's imperial bodyguard. The emperor funded her first album, which contained some of her most famous piano compositions. Any proceeds from the album were donated to liturgical students, and Emohoi continued this practice for the rest of her life. In 1967, Emohoi took a five-year pilgrimage to Jerusalem, and she continued to compose, often incorporating religious titles like Golgotha, Via Crucis, and Ave Maria. Shortly after her return to Ethiopia, a military coup deposed Emperor Selassie. The repressive regime weakened the Ethiopian Orthodox Church and restricted emigration. For nearly 10 years, Emohoi composed pieces and songs with titles reflective of her country's turmoil. Titles like Fatal Night of 24th November 1974, Is It Sunny or Cloudy in the Land You Live? Only in 1984 was Emohoi granted permission to leave, and she resettled in Jerusalem with its nearly 140,000 citizens of Ethiopian heritage, and she lived there for the rest of her life. She released another recording in 1996, and in 1998 sought to help sought the help of her niece to distribute her music more widely. Her niece's involvement eventually led to the inclusion on a comprehensive box set of Ethiopian music released in 2006 by the French label Buddha Musique. Emohoi was given the 21st volume in the set, and it brought her international fame. This also marked, sparked a late in life resurgence of compositional activities and numerous concerts in her honor. The image of Emohoi at her upright piano in her monastery bedroom in Jerusalem has become iconic for her fans. She passed away last March at the age of 99. As just mentioned, Emohoi gained wider recognition following the release of the Ethiopique's box set in 2006. This was followed in 2008 by the establishment of the Emohoi Sege Mariam Music Foundation, spearheaded by her niece. In addition to providing scholarships and educational outreach for underserved children, this foundation has reissued some of Emma Hoy's recordings, hosted concerts of her music at the Kennedy Center, for example, and published some of her music scores. In 2013, the Israeli musician Maya Junitz celebrated Emma Hoy's 90th birthday with a concert, an article, and the release of several transcriptions of her piano music. There have also been articles about Emma Hoy in a variety of high-profile publications, including The Guardian and New Yorker. Most recently, the pianist Thomas Fang began working on an in-depth doctoral dissertation on her life, music, and influences. More than anything, however, her music has gained wider appeal by being attached to popular adjacent projects. 
Two of her pieces were included in the soundtrack of the 2021 Netflix movie, Passing, which starred Tessa Thompson. Her music has been included in commercials for Amazon Echo, Apple Watch, and Walmart. And Nora Jones listed Ethiopia's first in a New York Times contribution called 10 Things That Keep Nora Jones Grounded. Emma Hoy composed over 157 compositions and published three albums on vinyl and two CDs. Her music includes pieces for solo piano and pieces for accompanied voice, including songs and hymns. The piano works have mostly programmatic titles, although she did compose some generic pieces, a nocturne, a sonata, a fantasy, seven symphonies for piano, in a period immediately before the revolution in 1974. While a few dozen of her piano and vocal pieces are easily accessed on YouTube, most of her output is unfortunately inaccessible, mostly because it was never recorded for the public. Her bedroom in Jerusalem had cassette after cassette of homemade recordings, and these will be a tre treasure trove for those wishing to publish the rest of her music. Only 17 of her scores have been published. 16 of them were transcribed by Mary Sutton from the Ethiopics album, and the 17th was transcribed by Thomas Mann. Emma Hoy's musical style is difficult to categorize. It has elements of jazz and elements of classical music and has been compared to the likes of Satie, Chopin, and Delta Blues. The Satie comparisons come through her intentionally narrow harmonic vocabulary. Many of her recorded pieces utilize only a handful of different harmonies, and some, Mother's Love and Homeless Wanderer, for example, which is her most frequently performed piece, use only one and five. The Chopin reference lies in Emma Hoy's florid melodic figures and her finely attuned sense of rubato and agogic accent. The Chopin connection also stems from her frequent use of waltz accompaniments, which Emma Hoy often distorts by adding or subtracting beats. The blues reference might arise from her occasional use of abrupt chromatic shifts. Her music also reflects her background in orthodox chants and traditional Ethiopian music, both of which feature pentatonicism. The mix of these varied styles results in a music that is tonal and melodically inventive and memorable. Her skill as a pianist also shines through her music's sparkling qualities. Emma Hoy uses pentatonicism in almost all of her pieces in some way or another. The Jordan River song is strictly pentatonic for its first 21 measures, for example. Another characteristic that stems from her use of pentatonicism is a frequent occurrence of tonic harmonies with the added sixth, which is frequently alternated with a six-seven chord. You can see it here by the prominence that B has within the D harmony. So we're in the key of D major, but there are a lot of Bs within that. harmonies is the major submediant, which is constructed above a flattened sixth scale degree. This is often heard as a borrowed chord from the parallel minor key. In most of the transcriptions, however, the chord is notated enharmonically. Here, an F flat major harmony written as E major, it's up there in the fourth measure, or more clearly here, an E major harmony which should actually be written as F flat follow the A-flat major tonic chord. It is also used as a chord to slide down to the dominant. compositions on her use of abrupt chromatic shifts. In this example, E flat major tonics, sandwich, an E major seventh chord, and then a fully diminished seventh chord. Um, unfortunately, it's 
down here inside the cut up. <laughs> so you have um, an E major seventh chord, which follows an E flat major tonic, back to E flat major tonic, and then um, a fully diminished seventh chord, perhaps built on the G sharp, and then uh, back to E flat major. Neither of these can be analyzed using Roman numerals or with common tones. to as anticipatory figures. MOA often previews the next chord through elaborate melodic gestures at the end of measures. In this example, the pitch is the tonic harmony with the added note of F, when you see an A flat major, occurs at the end of a measure of dominant seventh, anticipating the A flat major tonic. Transcriptions of Mary Sutton are highly detailed and notate Emma Hoy's performances. Uh, the transcriptions of Mary Sutton are highly detailed and notate Emma Hoy's performances exactly with extensive tempo fluctuations, meter changes, accents, and varied articulation. They are remarkable transcriptions, yet it remains most important that the pianist internalize Emma Hoy's style and not become a slave to the notation. The risk is that the performance could become too literal and bogged down in detail. So notice, for example, almost every measure has a different time signature. Um, five eighths, six eighths, seven eighths. Um, there are quite a few poco acalorandos, poco ricordandos, um, highly, uh, detailed um, approach to articulation, yet when you listen to Emil Hoyt perform, it feels 
uh, just sort of work like a rocking rhythm.